Okay, so let's get started. My name is Lizzie Barnes from Queen Mary University of London uh, Law School and with Kate Mallison, I co-direct our School of Law Centre for Research on Law, Equality and Diversity. And with the Childhood Law and Policy Network, we're, I'm gonna, we're just delighted to welcome you for this really interesting, important, webinar um, and I'm just going to hand so just very welcome to everyone and to our speakers and I'm going to hand over to Hedy our colleague in the School of Law um, who will be chairing the rest of the session so over to you Hedy. Many thanks Lizzie um, and also thanks to Kate and to the Center for Research on Law Equality and Diversity for co-hosting this uh, webinar um, as Lizzie mentioned, uh, the Childhood Law and Policy Network is also co-hosting, uh, and for those of you interested, it's a global network of scholars and practitioners who are engaged in research on children and childhood. So uh, the network has a website and social media pages, and if you're not familiar with our work, just look us up on Google. Uh, again, the name is uh, the Childhood Law and Policy Network. So the topic of our webinar today is a very important one. Should children have the right to vote? And if so, should the voting age be lowered or should it be abolished completely? And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights tells us that the right to vote is uh, universal and equal. That's a quote for all citizens. And this principle is also reiterated in various other human rights documents, such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. But in reality, most of the young people who are legally defined as children are denied this basic right. And today we'll be hearing from two excellent speakers um, about this topic from different perspectives. Um, so our first speaker will be John Moore. Uh, John is a professor of philosophy, religion, and childhood studies, and also the director of the Childism Institute at Rutgers University, Camden in the US. He's a theoretical ethicist who is author or editor of nine books, as well as numerous articles and chapters. And his key areas of uh, research are political philosophy, post-structuralism, children's rights, childism, and childhood studies theory. He also co-founded the Children's Voting Colloquium, which is an international organization of scholars and activists dedicated to eliminating all voting ages. And today, John will discuss one of his recent books titled, Give Children the Vote, Democratizing Democracy. Now, our second speaker will be Christine Eubner. Christine is a lecturer in quantitative social sciences at the University of Sheffield's Methods Institute. Her research explores how young people want to be engaged in political processes and how they look at things like citizenship, democracy, and political engagement. Christine has accompanied and collected evidence on the outcomes of the lowering of the voting age in Scotland and Wales. And this is also the topic of her talk today. And she's been providing evidence-based advice about lowering the voting gauge to policymakers around Europe. So a bit about the format of our event. We'll start with, with each of the two speakers uh, talking for around 20 minutes or so. Then we'll have time for questions and comments. So you have a tab at the bottom of the screen called Q&A, questions and answers, and you're very welcome to um, uh, write your uh, questions and comments there throughout the event, and I'll collect them and present them to our uh, speakers today. I'll also note that the event is uh, uh, being recorded and will be made available online afterwards. So uh, without further ado, John, the floor is yours. John, can you? Sorry, can you no, I'm unmuted. <laughs> Thank you, Hedy, for that introduction, and Lizzie and Kate for, for also inviting me here. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm going to share some slides with you. Um, 
Here they are, I think. Um, hope that's working. Okay. So um, I, I want to present um, what for me has been an evolution in thinking over the past decade that resulted in this book that came out um, earlier this year uh, called Give Children the Vote on Democratizing Democracy. Um, the overall argument I make here is that the third of humanity who are under 18 years old should be given the right to vote, all of them, not just some of them, because most of them are in fact competent to vote if voting competence is properly understood. And even more importantly, um, giving the children the right to vote would improve the lives of uh, children, adults, and, and societies and, and, and strengthen democracies. So I want to present some of the background to this and some of the ideas behind why, why I think this. Um, just briefly, uh, the, the theoretical groundwork is this concept of childism, which refers to empowering children by critiquing norms and structures. So it's meant to be an analogous concept to feminism, um, critical race theory, decolonialism, and, th and other perspectives that attempt to demarginalize groups who have been normatively and historically marginalized. Uh, and in this case, uh, childism is about deconstructing adultism or patriarchy, pa the pater, the pater, pater, or father being not just gendered but but aged, and reconstructing social imaginations in response to that to make them more expansive. And I've developed a couple of concepts of deep interdependence, empowered inclusion, things like that that are ways to systemically. Uh, rethink society is in response to this marginalized uh, group. Now, voting is a is a particular example of of uh, the, this effort and um, a particularly egregious example of uh, adultism, in in my view, and the ways in which societies are structured around adults instead and not around children. It'll, I want to start by providing a little bit of context in history, um, because I think this helps to explain why this is possible. Um, the um, history shows that there's been a gradual expansion of democratic voting to different groups, but what it also shows and what's less often discussed is that with this expansion comes very different ideas of what democracy is and what voting is for. Um, for example, if you think about when, for example, landowning males, um, landowning men got first got the right to vote in 1689 in, in, in what was in England. Um, well, what, what did people think democracy was if they thought that only landowners should have it, uh, should, should be voters within it? And it has to do with a concept of the Commonwealth um, with the idea of those who, pay taxes on their land are the ones who should get to decide what happens to the larger land that they own. Um, and this was the state of affairs when my country, the US, was uh, created its constitution. Um, it, it was only about 6% of the population of the US who had the vote uh, uh, in 1789. And uh, that was only landowning men. So people obviously thought about democracy in a very different way then. Well, as other groups have gained the vote, like other white men, non-white men, women, 18-year-olds, uh, and now more, more recently 16-year-olds in about 20 or so countries around the world, and lots of localities as well, um, the concept of voting has, has changed radically over time. Uh, what, what does it really mean to vote, and what kind of a society is, is a democracy founded on the idea of voting? Um, we can talk about that history some more later on, but my, my point is simply the idea of voting is not just extending one concept of voting to more people, the, the actual idea itself changes over time. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, um, another historical context is international law. Uh, the UDHR in Article 21 says that everyone has the right to take part in the government of their country. And this should be by universal and equal suffrage. Um, 
the, the IC CPR of 1966 um, has a similar kind of statement in Article 25 that uh, everyone, every citizen should have the right and opportunity to vote and be elected by universal and equal suffrage. Um, and of course, the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child from 1989 um, advocates that children should have the right to freedom of expression in all matters that affect them. Um, obviously, political matters affect children greatly, so that could potentially be also thought of as included there. So there's this historical context and there's also this historical blind spot around children um, uh, where the, the, the vote technically should belong to them, but, but doesn't. And the other historical context I want to just briefly mention is there have been many voting rights movements for children, both led by children and also led by adults or com in combination. Uh, since the 1990s, there have been groups like Kretzer Foundation for the Rights of Future Gen Generations, Children's Suffrage Association, N Naira in the U.S., uh, and other child-led groups that have been fighting in the courts and um, in the public arena for universal voting rights, regardless of age. And there have also increasingly been adults who've joined in this, this um, activism. Um, Groups like Amnesty International UK, Demos, Council of Europe, um, the uh, 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 Children's Voting Colloquium, which I've I've been leading, and, and many other group, groups um, around the world have been involved in this. And finally, there have been lots of academic discussions since the 1970s about this, um, with John Holt and Richard Farsham uh, making the first arguments, but then... Um, increasingly joined by political philosophers, lawyers, economists, and, and others. So <clears throat> when I first started writing this book, I thought that the main issue was uh, addressing the idea that children are not competent to vote. And I still think it's important, but I actually don't think it's the most important thing, which I'll get to in a minute. But just to talk about the issue of competence for a second, because that is what people usually say in objection to, to an ageless vote. Um, my, part of the argument I make in the book is that the idea of competence has also changed historically. And there have been certain ideas of competence that have allowed uh, the electorate to think or, or allowed citizens to think that only certain groups should get to vote. Um, uh, and so today, the, the predominant idea of competence is an adultistic one, which is that you have to have reached a level of independent rationality or maturity or responsibility or something like that to therefore be uh, permitted to vote um, if you want to. And I, my argument in the book is that that's the wrong measure of voting competence. And in, in fact, a childish measure of voting competence would be based on a, a notion of interdependent relationality, um, on the idea that humans are not autonomous individuals. They're actually deeply interdependent on each other and they rely on each other for empowerment. And the fact that children are in some senses, perhaps economically or other ways, not always, but often, more dependent on adults than adults are on them doesn't change the fact that everybody is interdependent and everybody has dependencies on each other and everybody's related. So this concept of independent rationality just is not a good basis for un understanding a democracy. Truly democratic competence can be understood by working backwards from what democracy is supposed to be all about. And, and throughout history, democracy has really been about holding those with power accountable to those they hold power over. Um, and if that's what democracy is, then the competence to vote should include basically these three things. You should be able to cast a ballot walk to, walk in whatever form that happens. You should be able to examine your own and others' views on politics and political matters and social matters. And you should be able to make the available political choices, let's say, between uh, um, one party and another party, or between Brexit or not Brexit, or or, or whatnot. Um, and 
And in my view, all of those things exist the moment you have the desire to vote. <clears throat> if you are capable of wanting to vote, you're, you're automatically, that means you're capable of all those other things, which therefore means that the only truly democratic test of competence is whether or not you want to vote, um, which in turn means that anybody who wants to vote should have the right to vote. And, and your age has nothing to do with it. So when people say, for example, that you have to be impartial to vote or have a certain level of neuroscientific maturity or a certain ability to not be manipulated by others, um, what I say is that um, those are the wrong measures. And actually those measures don't measure adulthood anyway. Um, adulthoods are not, adults not, are not impartial. They're not, neuroscientifically uh, perfect. Um, they're not independent from manipulation. They're not rational, um, as we often see. Uh, they're just the wrong measures. They're adultistic biases that we've inherited from history. And um, we need to understand what the real competence to vote, what the real um, franchise capacity consists in. And when you set an age, whether it's 18, 16, 14, 12, 6, whatever it might be, there have been proposals, all of those have been proposals made in the literature. What you're doing is um, discriminating against anybody under that age who wants to vote and including people over that age who may not want to vote. Um, you're, um, you're being over and under determinative in setting the measure of who should vote. But like I said, as I said, as I, as I was writing the book, I came to believe that the issue of competence is, is important to deconstruct, but the real reason why children should have the right to vote is that it would actually lead to much stronger democracies. And um, that's actually also been the case historically, that as new groups have come in, <clears throat> the diversity of perspectives thereby introduced into the electorate has strengthened democracy and not weakened it. it the fear has always been that it will weaken it, <clears throat> but the opposite has always turned out to be the case. And the reason for that is that basically democracies do kind of work, uh, at least compared to the alternative um, autocratic possibilities. <clears throat> so the more democratic a society can be, um, the more likely it is to make better choices and to be more respectful of the of the people in 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 that society and to be more responsive to their their needs. So, um, on one level, maybe the more most obviously, um, ageless voting would allow democracies to respond better to children, who generally speaking are the the poorest. Um, they have the least um, resources available to them and, and the, the, the fewest rights um, in their societies. When, when representatives are, are not just responding to children out of beneficence, but actually responding to them on the same basis as adults, which is their jobs depend on it, um, then children's interests and experiences can, can no longer be so easily ignored. Um, I'm not saying that everything would be wonderful because it isn't for anybody in a democracy, but I am saying that um, children's poverty would be dealt with more likely. Climate change would probably be a more urgent matter <clears throat> because children are the ones facing that in, in the greatest, in the strongest way as they look to their futures and, and also their presence. Um, gun control in schools in my country might be dealt with seriously at last. Um, and then an education might be funded more better and education might not be directed by meaningless testing, but actually have some purpose and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> but in addition to that, children voting would benefit adults and societies. So people who work with children or live with children or deal in any way with children, which of course is all of us, um, parents, teachers, lawyers, doctors, uh, business leaders, you name it, they would all have to operate under more child responsive policies because policymakers would have to respond more to the young people in, in society. So just as a very simple example, um, 
uh, teachers would probably find that, that their jobs are more related to what children really need and, and better supported by, by proper education policies um, and so on and so forth. Uh, the same for social institutions, uh, the same for societies overall, the same for the working of e econ economic structures and so on and so forth. Um, all you would have, um, all the pixels on the screen when you're making political choices and not just two thirds of them. And so you would have a less blurry picture of what you need uh, to do. And, and finally, um, children voting would strengthen democracies, um, not only by improving the lives of children and adults, but also by making democracies more democratic. So there would of course be a fuller representation of the demos or the people. Um, there would also be transformed democratic norms as has happened with the enfranchisement of groups over history so that democracy isn't about a competition of individual autonomous people fighting for resources as, as it sometimes now devolves into, but it would be an interdependent um, responsiveness, responsibility to each other uh, uh, as members of a interdependent group in society. Maybe I'm being a little idealistic here. It would have a longer timeline. It wouldn't be so present focused and immediate focused, um, especially since the most powerful group in many democracies is the elderly who have the shortest time frame personally to worry about. Uh, but in fact, but it would take on a longer time frame, for example, around economic policy, as some have argued, um, health policy and climate policy and things of that nature. And also, as um, my colleague Michael Cummings has argued, um, when you raise, when you teach people throughout the, the formative first years of their lives, the first quarter of their lives or whatever it is up to 18, that their voice doesn't matter. It's no wonder that people are rather cynical and disengaged when they do become adults in the democratic process. So democracies would also be strengthened by people being more engaged in democracies because they would have been taught instead from the day they're born that their voices do matter in democracy and we want to hear from them. So you would grow up with that idea. And you would also grow up being becoming less susceptible to authoritarian appeals, which are, which are, are on the rise around the world. Um, you would you would feel that you were empowered to not just listen to what the more powerful few have to say, but actually to to bring your own ideas and perspective to to, to society. Um, I, I've also argued in the book that democratic theory itself would be changed. Um, and we can talk about that as well, if you like. <clears throat> but um, can, to wrap up, um, there are various ways in which you could provide ageless democracy. I try to make in the book this what I consider a radical claim for what I call a proxy claim vote. And so my argument is not just to simply keep the vote the way it is and give it to everybody regardless of old, how old they are, which is still adult centric. And nor is my argument to go to a proxy vote for all children, because that's also adult centric. It doesn't give children their due. Instead, I had this proxy claim idea, uh, which is based on a, on a more interdependent concept of, um, of, of democratic voting. Um, and I'm really what I'm trying to do is eliminate age as a discriminatory factor, as other factors have been eliminated over history. So the idea is that um, everybody from the day they're born, if they're a citizen, I guess, or I, I don't think they have to be, but that's another question, till the day they die, uh, has a vote. Uh, if they're not able to exercise that independently for themselves, then someone else can exercise it on a proxy basis for them. So if you're a baby or a young child who doesn't even know what voting is, if you're cognitively, severely cognitively disabled, you have dementia, or even if you're just traveling or hospitalized or something else, um, which are in fact bases for proxy voting in, in many countries, the last ones, um, then someone should be able to vote uh, on your behalf. Um, 
I, I would estimate that you'd probably have this, a similar number of young people to older people uh, having a proxy voter. It would be like your next of kin or your whoever's, uh, whoever would make medical decisions for you could, could, could do this as well. But more importantly, the claim side is that at any point in time, any age, under any conditions, you can claim uh, to exercise the vote in your own right. You can exercise your desire to, to vote independently on, you, on your own behalf. And you could be a, a four-year-old who wants to do this because you desire to vote. And so therefore you are, should be deemed competent to vote. Or you could be someone who's recovering from se se severe illness who claims as an adult uh, to, to want to, to claim back your, your vote. But the point is, you, would, you, you have a vote no matter what, but you can also claim to exercise it on your own behalf um, whenever you like. So I think it's only really historical prejudice that keeps children from being given the vote. Um, in reality, it would be much better if children had the vote. Um, there are children's groups trying to get the vote. Um, I encourage you to look up Childrenvoting.org, which has, uh, which is the children's voting colloquium that I that I co-founded. If you want to learn more about that, but there are many groups uh, thinking and working on this issue around the world. Um, but thank you, and I look forward to your your comments. Thank you so much, John, for the brilliant time management as well. There's so much, uh, so many aspects to the, to this issue and uh, you did a brilliant uh, job at packing a lot of that into 20 minutes i i would encourage those who are interested to read john's writing on the subject because i know there are many other things you've explored in your work that you weren't able to uh include in those 20 minutes um one one um issue which you alluded to and i think that's a link to christine's uh work um is the question of how once someone um, is granted the right to vote, how that actually changes their political capacity. So rather than capacity being a pre-existing fact on the basis of which um, suffrage is being distributed, there's actually a reverse relationship as well in which the way you give people rights, that makes them more engaged and more informed. Um, but there are other issues. Uh, it, there's also a lot to say, and we'll talk about that later, in terms of your diagnosis of the issue, in terms of the context, but also in terms of the solution you're proposing, because as I think you've also alluded to, even among people who support um, giving children the right to vote, there are differences of opinions in terms of the model, uh, not only in terms of whether the voting age should be lowered or abolished, but even among those who want to abolish it, some support proxy voting, as you mentioned, whereas others don't. So maybe that's also something we can explore more. And I encourage um, everyone attending as well. Again, if you have any thoughts or questions about that, I see we already have some questions in the Q&A. Q &A, you're all welcome to add yours. So I think... Um, Organically, that leads us to Christine's uh, presentation. Christine, take roughly 20 minutes and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Hedy, and uh, also Lizzie and Kate. I'm excited to be here and uh, share my thoughts. Um, I always like listening to John because I'm quite envious of his capacity to theorize some of these issues. Um, my role is as an empirical social scientist so I look at the empirical evidence, and as Hedy has already said in his very kind introduction, I have collected a number of pieces of evidence on recent lowerings of the voting age. Um, most debates are about extensions of the franchise to younger people, and John has mentioned this as well, kind of revolve around three broad types of arguments. There is that argument of maturity or knowledge, are children and young people able to make political decisions? We have arguments about alignment or misalignment of political rights and responsibilities allocated to children and young people at different ages. And then we have what we sometimes call demand side factors, that sort of young people's interest in and demand for voting rights. 
And the crux of all of these arguments is that they are not entirely theoretical or political in nature. Uh, that means they can all be investigated to some extent empirically. We don't have much experience on young children voting in national elections, but we do have experience from 16 and 17 year olds voting in national elections in a number of countries, as John has mentioned. And voting rights for younger people, i.e. younger than 18, which is currently the most common uh, voting age around the world, is not simply a black box. We're not tapping in the dark when we uh, discuss these issues about what may happen and likewise what is important when younger people gain the right to vote for the first time. So um, you can see on this world map that there are now a number of countries around the world that have the franchise for 16 and 17 year olds in national elections or in another level of elections at sort of national level. And um, we can investigate what is important when these young people are enfranchised in these countries where we have already seen a change in the franchise. So in this talk, what I would like to do is to take you through some of the empirical evidence. And I, I have handpicked sort of some bits that I found uh, interesting from my work, um, evidence of what we already know and what happens when young people, those younger than the age of 18, gain the right to vote in national elections. And I really do not want to convince you about whether or not we need a voting age lower than 18 or present arguments in favor or against. Instead, what I want to do is convince you that debates about these kinds of arguments that I've started out on maturity, knowledge, demand, are not really very helpful and that there is empirical evidence available to settle many of these arguments. What we should rather discuss is actually, and I hope to convince you, is, is John's work is sort of the political nature and the, the democratic question behind whether or not we enfranchise younger people. And there's probably no factually right or wrong answer behind that, but it's fundamentally about what kinds of societies we want to live in and what enfranchising children and young people can mean for our politics. So I draw on empirical evidence um, from research that I have conducted myself in Scotland, the Netherlands and Germany. Uh, but I should also say that I've been doing lots of work collaboratively with colleagues at the University of Edinburgh um, the University of Huddersfield, Lancaster University, and a research fellow in my previous role at Nottingham Trent University. So I'm drawing a lot of evidence today that is not all my work. Um, so what you can see here is countries that are currently have either um, implemented votes at 16, so voting rights for 16 and 17 years, that's the dark blue ones. I've done work in Scotland and Wales. Austria in Europe has been uh, prominently the first country to lower the voting age for two 16 and 17 for all national elections. Malta has followed suit. There is a complicated situation in Greece. Then you can see the lighter blue countries. These are all countries that have either seen a uh, lowering of the voting age in some elections. Prominently at the moment, Belgium and Germany are working through legislation to enfranchise 16 and 17 year olds at the national level, and they already have the franchise at the regional level. Um, and then the lighter blue ones are all countries that kind of have debates going on at the minute about the lowering of the voting age. So you might say it's, it's kind of fashionable um, at the minute to discuss, especially in sort of progressive governments, whether we should enfranchise younger people. And in these debates, um, we often talk about sort of supply and demand side factors. So let's settle the first argument straight away. Um, one of the most persistent questions, would young people take up the right to vote if they were allowed to do so? Uh, here is some data that I'm bringing you from Wales, where young people, 16 and 17 year olds, were allowed to vote in a Welsh election, not in a British election, for the first time last summer in 2021. And what we can see here is um, the self-reported voter turnout in that Welsh election in May last year. Uh, we can see that 16 and 17 year olds actually turned out in greater numbers than the next age group, which is 18 to 24 year olds, and roughly uh, sort of uh, to the same extent as people all the way up to the age of 55. After that, uh, we have higher turnout among all the voters, um, but basically 16 and 17 year olds voted in comparable numbers to, um, young, uh, to people all the way up to the age 55. 
Um, so for 16 and 17 years, and this, by the way, this I brought you data from Wales. We've seen exactly the same kind of pattern in Austria, where we have very good data on turnout amongst young people, and also in various elections in Scotland, where we now have data from elections all the way back to 2014, when the voting age was lowered for the first time. And we always see this kind of like a U-shaped pattern where 16 and 17 year olds turn out in higher numbers than 18 to 24 year olds. And then the um, voting likelihood uh, increases again as people grow older. We can, we can speculate why that's the case. And we have a number of really plausible arguments um, that young people, especially when they sort of turn 18, they finish uh, school um, they are very mobile. Um, they often move about to university or for work, and at that age group, are very occupied with their own advancement in life and being less embedded in local communities. Whereas at 16, 17, many scholars have argued that young people are more embedded still in their families, in their local communities, and also civic education and school hits very differently when all young people are still in school versus sort of that more differentiated landscape at 18, 19, 20, when young people go to college, go into further or higher education or some into work. Um, so we, we are pretty uh, confident now that this is sort of a general pattern that we see um, that when we enfranchise young people at a younger age, uh, specifically younger than 18, 19, when a lot of a change happens in young people's lives, we have better opportunities to encourage young people to vote. Um, this noted in, in Wales, there were um, a lot of, uh, there was a lot of variation in the proportions of young people, uh, first of all, registered to vote ahead of the election and later on uh, in, uh, participating in the election across local authorities in Wales and also across groups of young people. So there is still a lot of um, stuff to work out, particularly for policymakers in terms of election awareness, vote, making voter registration work for young people and um, getting young people to turn out on, on election day. We have done a lot of work around the election in Wales. We have um, worked with almost 100 young people for months sort of leading up to the election and then right after the election. And we've mapped some of the, the distinct problems that come about um, when we enfranchise younger people that maybe are not the same, um, true in the same way for adults being uh, enfranchised for the first time. And we have a lot of questions on how 16 and 17 year olds sort of experience having the right to vote and what we can crucially learn from that for future elections, but also for enfranchising other groups of, of young people. Many of the barriers for young people to turn out to vote uh, hold in the same way for adults. Um, for example, if you have never voted in a country with voter registration, like many Anglo-American countries before, then voter registration is a massive hurdle. But some aspects of that are really quite specific to, to children and, and young people, and we need to think about them. And this is a, a part of a lot of my work with policymakers when, when I get questions about um, regions or governments interested in lowering the voting age. What we found was the most most of the barriers specific to young people voting in practice really have not so much been on the demand side um, of, of voting, so young people not being willing or able to vote, but really rather on the, on the supply side. In fact, the vast majority of young people wanted to vote, but they didn't feel supplied with the kind of information they would have needed to register to vote or indeed to turn out to vote on the polling day. So um, in, in Wales in particular, but we've seen parts of that also in, in Scotland when the voting age was lowered there, as particularly that voter registration and the timing of voter registration just did not line up with uh, schedules for the election. So a lot of young people in Wales have said to us that they missed the deadline for voter registration uh, ahead of the election because they weren't aware of it. And for children and young people in particular, the way that voter registration works in many countries is by some sort of form of documentation, whether that's a national insurance number or a driver's license, documents that usually young people at this age, and particularly children, if we think about a lower voting age, do not have. So we need to kind of fundamentally rethink some of these things. In Scotland, there were huge issues about creating an electoral role and balancing out uh, requirements for child protection, 
uh, for people younger than 18. And um, we have, we've seen massive issues as well, sort of around the, the timing of elections, which in Wales, incidentally, um, what happened at the same time as major school assessments. Um, so young people simply didn't have the time to engage with the election in the same kind of sense as, as older people. Uh, there is a huge role to play for political parties. Um, one of the problems we've seen in Wales is that there was a complete lack of engagement from political candidates and political parties, specifically with young voters. And I think John has mentioned that in uh, his talk just now that we need to kind of have a rethink about how politicians and political candidates address young people as part of the electorate. And the media can play a huge role in this as well. And there are sort of two sides to that. On the one hand, a lack of engagement with young people as serious voters from the media really is, is another element of, of um, not taking young people seriously and not giving them any kind of experience of political efficacy. In Scotland, we've seen the opposite of that, where a lot of work has been done by the media, and particularly the BBC in Scotland, to include young people. For example, they the last um, television debate before the first vote that included 16 and 17 year olds had an audience that was entirely made up of 16 and 17 year olds. And that kind of creates a different um, level of interaction with, from um, the whole society as a whole with children and young people. I brought you one of the quotes from one of the young people we worked with here. This is from Bas 17 in Wales, and, and, and he kind of um, encapsulated that feeling of um, there being a lot of problems on the supply side, i.e. on political candidates and political parties not engaging with young people when he said, it's when you're getting a leaflet through the door and you're just like, oh, not another one. And yes, there's nothing for me in that either. Just like the rest doesn't exactly make you want to vote. So there was quite a lot of a lack of engagement from political candidates um, and the problems are not so much on the demand side rather than on the supply side. One of the things that honestly I didn't really expect when I started doing all of this work, but it's becoming quite important now is that um, there are lots of questions around political inequalities that we may want to ask when we talk about uh, enfranchising children and young people. We know, uh, and that is true for all voters, that there are groups of society that are much more likely to vote than other groups of society. And these things really replicate for young people. Not all young people are equally likely to vote, and particularly those who have some sort of family support that tends to be families that are already engaged in politics and are likely to vote themselves, have a huge impact on young people. We've seen this in Wales, and I brought you two quotes here from young people where those young people who did who did talk about politics with their family members and had that family support, whether that's on how to register to vote or where to go on election day, they turned out to vote. So Fleur 17 said, I think definitely if I didn't know so much about politics or if my family personally wasn't just generally so much into politics, I would have really struggled with finding information about parties. And then on the other hand, we had young people who didn't have this kind of family support, tended to come from families um, of lower social classes, and they also often did not turn out to vote. Toto 18, also from Wales, for example, said it, and she meant politics here, has never been anything big in our family either. And that was for her one of the reasons why it was really hard for her to turn out to vote. We can see this empirically as well. And interestingly, when we look at this um, quantitatively with sort of survey data, we also see that these, this sort of replication of inequalities isn't a necessary given. Um, so here we are, have some data that we've recently collected in Scotland, where we followed uh, cohorts of young people um, that have been enfranchised at 16, 17, and compared them to peers, cohorts of young people that have been enfranchised just a little bit earlier at 18 or older. And what you can see here is their self-reported turnout according to their parents' social class, their household's uh, social class when they were growing up. So you can see the bars all the way on the right and the left hand side are young people from upper middle class families. Uh, and the lighter blue bars are the bars for young people aged 18 and older. And the dark blue bars are the bars for young people uh, aged 16, 17. Um, and then as you go sort of further to the right, you see uh, different social classes going all the way down to young people from working class backgrounds or um, with non-working parents. 
And what we were really in, uh, ex what we were really stunned to see is that for 16 and 17 year olds in particular, there seems to be more political equality. In other words, uh, young people from working class backgrounds at 16, 17 were much more likely to vote than their peers at older ages. Unfortunately, in Scotland, this sort of this pattern didn't last. This is a pattern that only holds for 16 and 17 year olds. And when these same people then grow older, we see the same replication of political inequalities. So there are lots of questions, but for us, what this means is that um, there is something really interesting happening with regard to political inequalities, which means that some of that sort of standard pattern that we see in the entire population of people um, from certain backgrounds being much more likely to vote, and with that also much more likely to be represented in the political system, uh, that that can be mitigated. And you know, we can talk a little bit more in the discussion about education and um, family interventions that can play a role here. And uh, we don't know much about this yet, but it's a really interesting and encouraging finding. And it raises really important questions about the connection between enfranchisement at an age earlier than 18, uh, when most young people are still in school and live in the parental home and inequality in our political system. Um, and then the robustness and durability of this link uh, further on. One of the things that I also didn't expect when I went into this work is that there is quite some tension over the formal allocation of voting rights and then what young people experience. And so what I want to do um, to finish is to widen our view a little bit away from voting rights as a, a means to an end to sort of bring about a better society that has a better representation for young people and to see it as really just one piece and a bigger puzzle of how we see young people as citizens and john has alluded a little bit to that you know citizens all citizens every citizen should have the right to, to vote the question that is raises for me is what do we see young people and children and young people as are, are they citizens or are they not citizens if we do not give them that right to vote and when I talk about this to young people, there's sort of two things that I, I get to hear. On the one side, one of the experiences that we have, um, we, we've observed um, very strongly, particularly in Scotland, is that young people often uh, report an experience of empowerment and personal agency that they immediately and directly connect to the formal allocation of voting rights. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with the Scottish case, in Scotland, the voting age was lowered to 16 in connection with the independence referendum um, where Sc Scottish citizens were asked whether or not they wanted to become independent from the United Kingdom in 2014. And there was a lot of um, political discussion uh, at that time in Scotland. And after, immediately after the referendum, thousands of young people joined political parties. So there was a real sense of sort of connection of political agency and, and, and efficacy that was connected for these young people in Scotland to gaining the right to vote and being taken seriously as voters. And we know that on the demand side, one of the most stable predictors of young people's likelihood to make use of their right to vote is their perceived political efficacy. That means young people get the idea that not only do they gain the right to vote, but also their vote matters and political parties would, would listen to them. What is interesting now, though, is that that's not the only feeling that uh, I have heard of from young people in Scotland, but particularly also young people in Wales and colleagues in Germany, aren't lining at, and, uh, at all, have made the same observation recently, is that it also comes with some frustration about partial enfranchisement um, or sort of like citizenship in waiting. Um, so I brought a quote here from Lauren, uh, who I followed over the years. Um, I spoke to her first when she was 15, where she said, I mean, I feel like a citizen, but I feel like a partial citizen in a way that I don't have the same right as everybody else. Uh, so Lauren at this stage already knew she would be enfranchised at 16 in Scotland, but still she felt that the playing field was level compared to, for example, British elections or even for her peers in the rest of the United Kingdom who wouldn't have the right to vote in their home countries at the age of 16. When I met Lauren again when she was 18, she said to me the following, when people were like, how can you be involved in politics? You don't pay tax. And I'm like, I actually do pay tax because I work full time. And she laughed at this point. That's definitely something I think about. And it's nice to come back with that. <laughs> 
what Lauren is expressing here is something that also a number of other young people that I've followed over time have expressed is that the right to vote in itself is not a kind of a, a magic bullet for them. And it has to be sort of embedded with being taken seriously and being viewed as a full and equal citizen. So not only uh, does giving young people the right to vote only in some elections kind of um, jeopardize that, that experience, it also means that other kind of formal allocations of markers of adulthood, paying tax, driving a car, um, have played also an important role for young people to sort of gain that confidence that their voice matters. So what we might need to think about is uh, seeing young people much more uh, or seeing young people's allocation of rights and responsibilities much more as a holistic package and thinking about at what stage uh, do they have to have which kind of rights and responsibilities and what kind of citizens are we imagining young people to be at different kinds of ages. So to conclude, um, what I think we need to be thinking about instead of debating maturity or whether or not young people would vote, want to vote and what kind of um, what kind of systems we need to put in place, I think actually the questions that John's work raised are some of the most important and fundamental questions. We shouldn't consider existing levels of political participation or voter turnout when deciding whether or not to lower the voting age. So if 16 and 17 year olds or younger people do not want to vote, they won't, as is the case, by the way, with every other age group. And this should not be used as an excuse to deny those who are interested in voting the right to do so. If turnout is a problem and our empirical work shows that, is not so much a demand side problem, it's a supply side problem, and it needs to be addressed by politicians and political parties, changing their behaviors and relationships to the electorate, including children and young people, and not by changing the electorate. It's too easy to dismiss young people by saying they don't vote when it should really be asked what can be done to facilitate and encourage participation of young voters. And some of our work, you know, as, as has highlighted some of these barriers that need to be need to be um, mitigated. And I'm, I'm quite proud also to say that in particular, the Welsh government has taken some really important steps towards um, decreasing some of those barriers for voter registration, for example, for young people. Secondly, um, we also need to think about what is the potential role of enfranchisement of young people in, in the way that our societies work. And I, I personally really applaud John for bringing up that question and would like to see much more empirical work as well on the impact of voting rights for children and young people on our political climate, on levels of inequality and political representation, and on the kinds of political decisions that will be taken. So really that question, are we going to have stronger and more democratic democracies that John raised, is that something that we can investigate also empirically and what is going to happen with that? And lastly, uh, the last question I brought up um, is what kind of conception actually of young people as citizens do we have uh, and how do we want to, to view children and young people? So um, it's about different forms of involvement in society that require kind of different skills, different stages in our lives, meaning that not all rights and responsibilities could or even should be granted at the same age. And there is some evidence in my work and that of others that support this emergent idea that voting should play a part in this transition from uh, into, into sort of full citizenship. Some people call it transitions into adulthood. I would contest that. I, I would call it a transition into, into citizenship. Um, and rather than signifying every single moment at which one transforms from child to adult, um, we might need to um, view citizenship more as something that we sort of grow into gradually. And there's uh, numbers of evidence now that makes that argument that uh, gaining the right to vote has a role to play in that sort of transition, uh, but also in the way that young people see themselves and behave and claim that political right as citizenship. So it's kind of a two-way relationship. Thank you very much, Christine. Um, I think we're quite fortunate to have actually to have these two complementary perspectives, to have a more uh, conceptual philosophical one as well, as well as one that's grounded in um, empirical findings. Uh, I think that really enriches our discussion. We already have quite a few uh, questions in the Q&A, which I'll read aloud. Uh, I know I have a few of my own, but I'll wait with them.
Um, so first of all, I'll start with a comment uh, someone made anonymously. They say it's a comment. Uh, there's research from Austria since lowering the age to uh, six, the voting age to 16 there showed that political interest vastly increased among young younger uh, persons as a result of receiving the vote. Similarly, the value and impact of civic education uh, becomes more important following that uh, enfranchisement too. This research certainly lends credence to the idea that enfranchising persons plays an important role in the democratic process. So that's an interesting comment about um, um, trends uh, elsewhere where the uh, voting age was lowered. Um, there was another question anonymously, which wasn't uh, directed at either of you specifically, but it seems like it might be directed mostly at Christine. Uh, and that was a question about, are there conditions necessary to create a climate more accepting to engaging young people to vote? For example, stable governments and the working model of democracy. So I know, Christine, you've talked about some elements, but maybe you could expand on those aspects. Now, John, there are two questions questions or comments here on the same topic, which is proxy voting. I think two different, uh, potentially conflicting uh, uh, ones. So I'll start with one by Jonathan Todres, who some of you may, uh, as some of you may know, he's a professor of law at Georgia State University, who's written quite a lot on child rights. Um, and he's written two comments here. So uh, he starts by uh, thanking you for your talk. And he says he agrees with your outline of the benefits of recognizing the right to vote among children. Um, he wants to ask about your proxy approach. In the law, one needs to be competent when they give their proxy to another. He doesn't want to overstate the competence issue, but how would you, how would say a six month old give their proxy? Would we just assume a six month old understands voting and, and what it means to give their proxy? Uh, he sees how it might work at some ages, but can you speak to the first uh, thousand days? To be clear, he's saying he's not arguing against recognizing voting rights, but rather asking about how we ensure young children can realize their right to vote and avoid young children's votes being used by others who may, who may or may not vote as the child would. And then he adds a follow-up comment saying that some parents or guardians who are more resistant to the idea of children's rights would be more likely to claim the need to continue to vote on behalf of their children and thus claim that vote beyond when children can independently exercise their voting rights. Uh, so he certainly could see this playing out in the US as well as other places. He looks forward to hearing more. That's uh, a series of uh, observation maybe you could, uh, observations maybe you could respond to. Then, then we have um, a question from Harry Hathaway, who says, uh, as a follow-up to the discussion following Jonathan's uh, question about this, uh, he finds the proxy voting to be quite an interesting position to take, since uh, he often encounters this, encounters this being seen as a negative of enfranchising younger persons. Uh, he quotes a saying, well, the vote will just be what the parents want. Um, and he asks, what does your argument claim gain from including an idea of proxy voting over simply just maintaining uh, an enfranchisement for those who have the desire uh, to vote? Um, maybe if, if I can um, abuse my uh, uh, position and add to that, um, uh, John, really, I, I guess an alternative would be, which I'm, I'm sure you've considered and, and um, an alternative would be to just give universal uh, suffrage, regardless of age, and then once a child is able to, willing and interested in voting, they would do that. The same way I suppose that all adults have the right to vote, but then some of them stop voting, for example, when they have um, uh, dementia, uh, advanced stages of dementia, they still have the right to vote, uh, but they don't exercise it. Um, one one might say they should have a proxy vote, but maybe some people would consider proxy voting even in those circumstances problematic for the same reasons. So there's a lot to unpack. Sorry for that. Um, does either of you want to start? Christine, maybe you could. 
I can start taking a question on the requirements. I think it's a really interesting one. And interestingly, I don't actually think it's some of the things that you have outlined in your in your or in your proposed and your given. Interestingly, the voting age was first lowered in countries um, in Latin America in the 80s, and Cuba, in fact, was the first one to lower the voting age. We can now debate about sort of the state and stability of democracy in Cuba at that time. Um, so that might actually not be sort of the necessary requirements. I would argue, though, that there are certainly um, factors that really are helpful in, in particularly in implementing a lower voting age. And these things are sort of some really tedious uh, procedural factors, like how are we actually going to get young people uh, aware of their right to vote, particularly when there's a change in the policy? Because as John said, they usually have grown up being told that they can't vote and that their voice doesn't matter. And then how do we get through sort of all these uh, procedural barriers like uh, in this country, um, registering to vote. Uh, voter ID, for example, that you, some of you might have uh, followed that is, is a real headache for campaigners for lowering up the voting age because it will disproportionately affect younger people. Um, so so there, there are more sort of uh, procedural things that, that I personally in my work have thought about. I don't actually think that these bigger questions about you know how stable our democracies are are uh, that much of a factor in fact it might even be the other way around we've often seen that young people are getting more uh, engaged and more motivated to exercise uh, their right to vote when it's been given when things are not going well in the democracies because we know from empirical results that young people tend to have a higher agreement with certain aspects of democracy um, and they are willing to then also uh, raise their voices in favor of these. So you might, some of you might have followed the, the midterm elections in the US, or um, I'm sure John can talk much better to that. But I think the trend that we've been seeing is that uh, younger people tend to turn out to vote in higher numbers when, when things are at stake, and particularly when that at stake is democracy. Uh, um, I, I'd like to just briefly follow up on Christine's comment, actually. Um, <clears throat> an argument that David Runciman at Cambridge University makes about children voting is that gr large groups have usually been fr franchised over history when democracies are on, in crisis, when they're unstable, because it becomes the only way to solve the problem <clears throat> um, is by changing the nature of democracy. So I actually think this whole the, the crisis that all democracies are now facing may actually be the catalyst for expanding the voting age. But should I go ahead and respond to the? Okay, so on on the proxy question, yeah, I mean, since writing this book, my thinking has shifted a little bit, but I haven't changed my mind completely. So, that another possibility would be for adults to take their children with them to the voting booth and help them vote you know and, and even if they were couldn't really understand what was going on that that you're not changing the nature of voting to a proxy vote you're just expanding it that of course would leave out uh, the elderly and people with dementia and so on but i don't favor that actually i would i'm going to stick to my proxy claim proposal because well first of all um the, 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 the elderly, at least in the US, do have a quasi-proxy vote, which is that a, a, a caregiver can, in fact, fill out their ballot for them if they want. Um, and the, the, the elder, the, the, someone with severe dementia can say whatever they want, and you have to write down whatever they say. But if they say, I want uh, George Washington as my president, you know, you have to put that in and write it in. So, so there's a kind of proxy vote there already, which I wouldn't want there to be a, a, an age imbalance. But more broadly, um, I, yeah, I mean, I'm not, the, the proxy idea is meant in a less technical legal sense here. I, I'm, I'm using it in analogy to medical decision-making or economic decision-making or other important decisions that humans make for each other uh, when, when that person is unable to make them for themselves. So. It, as, as I briefly mentioned, you know, in, in the medical situation, parents, of course, or guardians make vital medical choices for babies in the, in the first thousand years, and they continue to do so, although those are gradually handed over to the child as the child gets older and 
there's actually some very interesting medical research on children's competence and capacity, which is much higher, of course, than we've generally assumed. Um, so that's, I think, a way around the technical legal argument. Um, I would also say, and I, I think it's a good argument to say that, well, how do you know if the proxy is going to vote in the interests of the person they're voting for? That is a, an issue. Um, however, I actually think the most, even more important than that is having the right to vote or having the likelihood of voting. Because what, what representatives actually respond to is the fact that you might kick them out of office next time around. So your, your, the fact that some a, a proxy person might decide that the way you've decided to, to change policy around babies was a bad idea is more likely to influence democratic politics than what the person actually votes for. I don't, I don't put that very well, but it's, it's, the, it's the fact that you have the right to vote that really gives you the power. And um, so beyond, so in terms of, uh, so that's John, Jonathan Todras' great question, and, and Harry Hathaway also raised a very good, good point, um, and Hedy as well. You know, what, what does um, proxy add, really, and why not just expand the vote? Well, I, I really don't think that um, very young children or the very elderly or others who are not actually able to vote on their own behalf uh, I think they would end up being highly marginalized, even more marginalized than they already are. And so if you think your one-year-old is a full and real citizen and human being, then the only way they're going to be represented is through a proxy vote. Um, and I don't think we should just brush that off. I think politicians ought to be held accountable, even, even to babies and, and one-year-olds. So that's why I would insist on the proxy anyway. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, everyone uh, in the audience, you're welcome to add your questions or, or comments. I'll, I'll ask a few, if that's OK. Um, first of all, uh, John, following up on this discussion of proxy, uh, because it seems to be something that's kind of igniting uh, some responses, I, I was wondering if you could speak a bit about whether necessarily needs to be parents who will get uh, proxy votes or whether we should have, I remember in the, there's a book uh, by Howard Cohen from uh, the 1980s, and he suggests that rather than basing child rights on the notion of capacity, what we could do is have adult agents appointed, appointed to assist children um, gain capacity as they mature. But those adult agents, he suggests, shouldn't be parents actually because parents are not disinterested uh, parties uh, they should be others so I, I was wondering if that's some something you think could be incorporated uh, into your model um, from an entirely different direction maybe a, another question do you have any thoughts about similarities between debates about child suffrage and some some of these earlier uh, um, um, shifts that you mentioned at the beginning of your talk uh, in relation to non-white voters and women, uh, there are some. There seem to be some striking parallels. So, could you talk about those and what lessons perhaps we can learn as you see them? And Christine, if I can um, add two questions to you, the, there were many fascinating uh, findings in your um, talk. Some of which were not very intuitive. I have to say. So I was wondering, one of them was that uh, you said we see that working class children vote more than working class adults. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts about why that might be. I, I guess one um, speculation could be that uh, maybe because they most of them don't have to go work full time. Uh, but that's just a speculation. Another question I have, uh, again, uh, affecting the, the maybe behind the fact that 16 to 17 year old voters vote at higher numbers than 18 to 24 year olds, which again is quite striking because there's always this myth that young voters vote less. So you actually show that it's not linear. Do we have any data from countries where voting is 
mandatory. I'm thinking of Australia, for example, where vo the voting age hasn't been lowered uh, below 18, but there have been some campaigns and bills to lower it. Do we have any such data? Because I wonder whether making the voting age mandatory would affect voting trends among different age groups. Maybe you could speak that, to that and then I'll collect some more of the. I see we have some new questions as well. John, do you want to start? Yes. Um, so I, I, I think in terms of the non-parental proxy, um, I, I, I would just see that as rather less democratic than a, than a parental proxy because um, you, you have the, then you would then have the question of who appoints the non-parental proxy and on, on what basis do they make their decisions and in my view you know, voting decisions are not um, about who has the best understanding of how everything should be run uh, they're about how do you express your grassroots lived experience uh, and I think that people closer to you are usually better at, at doing that um, we, we certainly do believe that in medical and economic and other situations we don't have uh, you know too many external arbiters deciding whether you should give your child Tylenol or not you know um, uh, the other question about, so I actually wrote an article comparing the children's rights movement, children's suffrage movement to the women's suffrage movement in the US and the UK. And um, it was really interesting. I actually found that the logic was almost exactly the opposite, or the, or the way the movement worked was, was almost opposed. So the, in, the, in the US and the UK, the women's suffrage movement starting in the mid 19th century began with this argument that women are equal to men and should have equal rights. And that failed because uh, people would just said, well, no, women are just different. And they said not as not as capable or something like that politically. Then the argument moved to a different centered argument, which is, well, we need women's differences because women are more pure and moral and good. And we need them to stop politics being so corrupt, <laughs> which also failed. And the one that finally worked was a different kind of what I call an empowerment argument, which is that when women moved into the labor force in larger numbers, well, I mean, of course, they were always in the labor force, but more visibly moved into the labor force and started organizing labor unions and becoming more politically active and chaining themselves to, to, to the parliament fences or whatnot. That's when finally the, the barrier to women's suffrage broke down and and it became generally acceptable. Of course, there were many men and women opposed to, to women's suffrage, but that's what finally won the day. Children's suffrage started at the other end. It started with this empowerment argument because it grew in the 70s from uh, out, out of uh, women's rights and civil rights movements. Um, and the idea that children are able to be just as empowered because they're fighting you know, against the Vietnam War or wh whatever it might be. Uh, it then moved into an equality argument, which is basically where most of the argument is now, which is, well, it's just an equal human right for children and that they're, they're equal citizens and, and so on. And my childism argument is actually an attempt to move us to the difference argument, which is we need the different voices of children um, to improve our democracies. So it's, it is a matter of justice, but it's also a matter of um, diversifying de democracy so they work better. So I don't know what lessons you can draw from that, but I, maybe it's a different way of looking at things. Yeah. I might also add that in Britain, at least the debate around lowering the voting age to 18, and you might have seen on John's chart that I was quite a substantive part of the population that joined the electorate then. Uh, had a completely different debate. It was all about sort of some of these arguments that we wanted to spend less time on tonight on uh, what we sometimes call social capital arguments, bring sort of uh, different political rights and the allocation of formal rights all to the age of 18, which at the time was seen as the, the dominant sort of uh, debate in favor of lowering the voting age, you know, changes in, in the way that we do democracy or hopes for an increased uh, turnout among younger people never played a role in those debates. It was really sort of all about the formal allocation of rights. And I want to pick up your questions, Hedy, on um, why working class young people seem to vote in higher numbers than working class adults. 
and uh, any kind of learn learnings from experiences from countries with compulsory voting. Um, we really don't know very much yet about this sort of pattern. And what I've shown you actually is also unpublished research. We, uh, my colleague Jan Eichhorn and I are having uh, hopefully that out later this month, um, but it's really something that we, we're, we're just working on. It is something that colleagues around the world have been finding that there seems to be uh, something specific when young people at the age of 16, 17 join the electorate that doesn't sort of uh, fall into this trap of the general, the usual pattern of um, inequality and in political representation. We can speculate about why that's the case. And I think I would start looking into um, effects of civic education. One of our um, attendees has pointed out that in Austria, where the lowering of the voting age nationally is considered a huge success because turnout numbers have increased massively among younger people, that has been coupled with a complete reform of civic education and secondary schools in Austria. And there are other countries where sort of similar processes have been happening. And I think we can sort of start looking into that. That being said, in Scotland, where most of my research is from and the data that I've shown you is from, we haven't seen any kind of comparable reform of civic education. Uh, and it's one of the things that we criticize the Scottish government for. And we also see when we follow the young people who have been enfranchised at uh, the first sort of opportunities in 2014 and then successively in 2016 and 2017, when they now turn older, so now that they're in their early 20s, we see that they fall back into the exact same pattern of political inequality as most of the age cohorts uh, in, in the electorate. So there is maybe a window of opportunity to really do something about political inequality, particularly for children and younger people, where some of these sort of uh, effects that might um, um, play a role here, uh, the kinds of um, people that you surround yourself with, the effects of having money and having time are not so uh, pertinent yet at that younger age, but really we're at the very beginning, I would say, of empirical investigation of this. The same, unfortunately, I can only say for countries with compulsory voting, there are actually a couple um, that already have a low voting age, the most uh, biggest one probably being Brazil. Um, there is a lot of idiosyncrasy around how these countries have implemented compulsory voting for particularly underage teenagers. Uh, in Brazil, if I'm correctly informed, uh, it, the voting uh, is not compulsory for 16 and 17 year olds. In other words, they will not be penalized uh, as adult voters who in Brazil will be barred from, for example, applying for a passport when they do not turn out in consecutive elections. That is not applied in the same way to children and young people. And uh, I've mentioned that in, in my talk as well a little bit, we have sort of really tedious little procedural barriers and, and attentions with child protection that we have to sort out when these kinds of things are just being transformed over to children and younger people. The other thing uh, that I want to bring up here as an empirical researcher is also that we just do not have the data to investigate these things, unfortunately. So often enough, uh, the kinds of data that we have is uh, uh, adult centric. Um, we often have survey data uh, from the age of 18, and we often do not really have the kind of data to evaluate these questions for 16 and 17 year olds. So the data I've shown you today, for example, we're extremely grateful that the Scottish government has made money available for us to poll young people in uh, sufficient numbers to be able to do these kinds of breakdowns by parental social class, but we often enough do not have that kind of data. Thanks so much. Uh, we have a few minutes left, so maybe we can do a, a one final round of uh, uh, questions and answers. So, um, and I see we have a new coming, a new one coming in. Okay, so I'll start with the comment by Alessandro De Nicola, who's a PhD student at uh, Roma Tre University. It's a comment. He says in Italy we recently reduced the voting age for the Senate from 25 to 18, as for all other elections. Uh, he adds that the Italian case is very unique since 1948, when the constitution came into force, the Senate has always been elected by the over 25s. Uh, he specifies that uh, in Italy, the Chamber of uh, Deputies and the Senate have the same powers. The recent general election was the first in which 18 year olds voted for the Senate. There is also discussion about reducing the voting age for local elections to 16. So that's uh, very interesting. Thank you uh, for that, Alessandro. Uh, we have a question here for uh, to uh, for to Christine from Tom Burke. Uh, 
um, who writes, I used to lead the votes at 16 campaign in England and spent uh, some of lots of time debating these issues. He wonder, wonders if you have any experience of how the process of campaigning for votes at 16 or the previous opposition to it may have impacted its implementation in Wales or Scotland. Finally, uh, Harry Hathaway uh, adds a question to John regarding uh, your last response, uh, John. He writes, is your inclusion of younger persons as an effort to expand upon the diversity of inputs rooted in any of the work from Iris M. Young. He uh, uh, reminds us uh, democracy of uh, difference or something along those lines. She's written on participation and, and uh, related uh, themes. Or the deliberative democratic arguments highlighting the more epistemic instrumentalist value of diversity. So um, I'll ask you, there's a lot to unpack there, but I'll ask you both to be uh, a bit uh, brief if you can, and we'll conclude with that. Uh, Christine, do you want to start? I'll start with um, uh, Tom's question. Uh, first of all, thanks for the question. It's, it's great to have you, Tom. Uh, there's a lot on this. Um, there is particularly in the way that the voting age of 16 come up, came about in Wales in comparison to what's happened previously in Scotland is, is very different. And um, my colleagues, uh, Tom Loughran and um, Andy Mykov have written an entire report on this, which is fascinating. And definitely the way that the policy is com comes about and the way that uh, is, it is complained for has a huge impact on all of these kinds of things that I've been trying to tie into my talk, but cascade down on how young people perceive themselves uh, as citizens. So we know that one of the most effective forms is when and young people themselves are driving forward the campaign uh, because then you immediately sort of have a, a base of, of voters who will take that up. There is, um, we're running, I'm working with colleagues in a global network that is investigating uh, votes at 16 around the world. And in January, we're planning to host a meeting where we're bringing out a report specifically sort of on these campaigning issues, what works, what doesn't work in the campaigning. So I'll type my email address into your uh, question and um, please follow up and then I can invite you to that. Yeah, I, I can I can I can say that Iris Marion Young has been a huge inspiration for me around democracy and inclusion. Um, and, and in a broader sense, um, the post structuralism is very helpful uh, for me because it allows you to think about difference as something normative um, where uh, dif differences of experience are marginalized in the sense of made invisible by the structures that are, that are around us. And voting is a really obvious example of that, that children's experiences are made invisible by the voting mechanisms we have. So people like Judith Butler and Jacques Rancière, Gayatri Spivak, um, those kind of post-structuralist uh, uh, ways of approaching democracy are very helpful and influential for me. But I will also add that not a single one of those people or any famous post-structuralist political philosopher or any political philosopher of any other kind has ever seriously considered the possibility of children having the right to vote or even being involved in politics. Um, it's all around gender, race, class, geography, and things like that. So there also needs to be some new, uh, I don't mean to dismiss anybody who's not a big name in one of those names I mentioned, but that that's been my experience. It's, it, it, children are even marginalized from discussions of marginalization. Um, so something has to change. Yeah. Thank you both. Hopefully we've done, we've contributed to in, in different ways to the effort to demarginalize children within uh, debates about marginalization. Can I thank you both wholeheartedly, John and Christine, for really rich uh, presentations. I'm sure you've given all of us a lot of uh, food for thought. Thank you also for Gulsh for um, uh, supporting us uh, in this event. Uh, thank you to Lizzie and Kate again for co-hosting and uh, helping with uh, everything. Uh, once again, everyone, the event uh, has been recorded and it will be made available online uh, soon, we hope. So thank you so much for attending and um, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Take care.